So let's get cracking. What are temporary works? So the definition of 5975 is fairly broad ranging. Uh, I'm not going to read it out to you because I'm sure you all have the ability to read. But suffice to say, it covers an awful lot of items. In fact, I can't think of a construction project you could do without some sort of temporary works. It's uh, a vastly enlarged definition compared to the previous revision of 5975, which I'll let you read there as well. But it includes now demolition gets a specific mention, not in this, not in here, but within 5975, whereas before it didn't even get mentioned. Um, support item of plant, hydraulic effects, stability, strength, deflection, fatigue. There's all sorts of things that have been fired in here to, to really broaden the limits of what 5975 covers and what, what you're expected to manage and control on the site. So they then go a bit further than that and they go through a, a, a not a comprehensive, but a pretty good starting point for what temporary works actually is. Uh, and you can see there, it is covers an awful lot of things um, from, as I said down here, you've got demolition specifically mentioned, buns, so buns, dewatering special, specifically in there, scaffolding, towers, that sort of thing, um, earthwork support, support of plant or other things, stability of waterborne craft, securing sites, so hoardings and similar, um, shoring, propping, facade retention, construction modification or demolition so it's quite a broad quite a broad um base and i've just realized that all of the corners of this presentation is wrong so what does that mean in practice so starting at the, probably the first thing to go in is hoarding not the most exciting things in the world but they are the the client client the public facing elements of temporary works that most people will often see and there's plenty of good guidance out there best one being the hoardings of guide to good practice which takes you step by step through the design and what is expected of a hoarding. Gates, again, fall under temporary works. We see those more and more being required to be designed. Piling platform or working platform. A stockpile, now admittedly that's quite a small stockpile and you probably wouldn't need a specific design. It'd probably be covered by a, a standard that your company runs. But when you start talking about larger stockpiles, then um, quite often get asked to do checks on those. Um, existing structure that's been retained, so it might need property, it might not, but it needs an assessment to prove either way. And then go moving on to the other pictures there, and you've got hoardings again up here. You've got a existing basement wall in a temporary condition being propped. You've got a tower crane base. You've got access ways to the tower crane and the rest of the site. You've got materials stacked up, uh, not necessarily designed, but to be taken into account of in the design in terms of surcharges. You've got form work and false work over here. Uh, you've got lots of various types of propping. Um, over on the far right hand side, you've got rebar cage stability in the air. So that one we actually, um, from memory, we put a couple of scaffold beams in there. I think you can just about see them there and there. Uh, to which the frame to which the scaffolding would to sorry to which the reinforcement was tied and that gave it a, a nice robust lift and kept the whole thing nice and stable in the air uh, and again there's a, a good TWF publication specifically on the subject of rebar stability maybe not covering that exact circumstances but anyway the, the important thing is that it was controlled and it was recognized by the site team that it needed to be designed <coughs> uh, crane position so that's a 500 ton crane over there um Temporary earthwork stability, where we'd excavated out um, the stability of the abutment. So that is the abutment, and the other side of that is the railway. So it was to prove that that abutment was stable during the temporary condition. Formwork and force work, which you can't really see in there. The deck, uh, the precast deck beams going in to form the, the temporary or to form the permanent works. And the stability of those, particularly with reference to edge parapets. Uh, where they have the large, maybe 1.8 metre higher parapets cast in as part of the beams. They often need something to uh, keep them stable, though more and more I'm seeing that designed out, so you don't need to prop them, which is a positive step. Uh, and then there's hoardings again there, uh, walkways, there was scaffolding as well, all sorts of bits and pieces. That's just another view on it there, on the same site. 
Um, things like blowdowns here. So the structure in its temporary condition, when you pre-weaken a structure like this, you have to justify it that A is going to stand up from when they start the pre-weakening to when you try and blow it down. And uh, B, that the collapse mechanism is going to work. Though that's generally more, it's kind of a cross between the explosives engineer and the structural engineer there. But it's fundamentally about ensuring that the uh, building will not fall over in the temporary condition. This is quite an interesting one. So this was a job, uh, Josh actually did this one. This is in Manchester where we had to build the basement of a 30 something story building, um, quite a constrained site. There was an awful lot of temporary works that went in. So what's not quite clear here is on that side there, you have got a waterway. So there was assessment of the temporary loads onto that wall along the back there. There's the adjacent party walls here. So this had to be built up for a piling platform to go in, justifying, or in the case we went down the route of putting in a piling platform that had a reinforced earth wall at the front of it. So we didn't put any um, pressures onto the retaining walls. A typical piling platform in there, the L walls at the back there, which we used to bring the piling platform up to the correct level. And the general sequencing of the work there was an awful lot of temporary works that went into what was in effect quite a small site <clears throat> the more um i suppose the more impressive stuff tower crane grillages so not only is there the design of the steel work there's the design of the anchors into the concrete or however you're anchoring it um there's the effect of the temporary works on the permanent core quite often that becomes the permanent works engineers We'll do the assessment because they've already got the model of the core, but probably 30, 40% of the time we end up doing that as well. So considering the core and the tower crane itself, and what becomes very important then is the construction sequence. So it's understanding what happens when, so if the core goes up in isolation, the tower crane goes on top, that's a different load case to when the core is up and the building's tied to it. So there's all sorts of load cases to consider as you work your way through with the crane um mobile crane positions to put the tower crane up there again you can see hoarding you can see uh, piling platforms excavation works all sorts of things going on that all feed into to what we have to do when it comes to cut and carve projects um it can get really quite interesting because you've definitely got a uh, interesting overlap between the permanent works and the temporary works so this was a small job this was done three four years ago now where uh, they were taking out significant portions of the structure um and we did the full assessment of this structure in the temporary condition to justify the stability you might think it was fairly obvious it was stable given the size of those columns but we still had to put up a bit of a fight with the permanent works engineers to uh, to get them to come around to our way of thinking and then the propping for the structure um it's quite interesting way to work out where to prop this structure. The way we did it was we looked at expected deflections uh, when we cut the openings and worked out where to prop based on that um, and then check the effect on the structure with all the steel that remained. But quite an interesting structure to, to work on this one, but quite a small scale cut and carve. Um, assessment of structures in the temporary condition, in this case, Putney Bridge. Um, assessment of the abutments where the, the rear outriggers stand on the abutments um, assessment of the services underneath it uh, well there would have been some assessment of the lifting arrangement but that was probably the ap and the lifting eyes were came as part of the tbm package so our, the, the works there were really related to why has my screen just gone dark has that gone dark for everybody my screen then was it just me i can see your screen just fine this must just must just be my end then okay i'll carry on um on the left hand side here you have the um mobile crane in operation um lifting out uh, a bridge so there was the temporary stability of the supports that were left in for the bridge there was crash deck to protect the railway there's the crane position there was the planning and figuring out how to actually achieve the demolition works itself just going to stop sharing for two seconds and see if I can figure out what's going on with my screen because I can barely see it. 
apologies for this. I don't know what's just happened. It's like it's dimmed itself down. I don't know why. I don't know what I've done. I've pressed the button on my keyboard. That's what I've done. Sorry about that. Um, you see that again? Yeah, working just fine. It's fine. Sorry for that. Right. Can you see that one? Um, uh, assessment of the existing structure for what was a, um, a rolling gantry crane, um, the design of the gantry beams themselves or the crane rails themselves, the assessment of the structure as it was demolished. Uh, on the left hand side, you've got a design of the frame, the frame rails, the assessment of the structure in the temporary condition, access ways, all sorts of things. Uh, fairly obvious temporary works here, propping working platforms, temporary stability of the structure, um, propping and support systems. Uh, all sorts of things on that one, facade retention scheme. So why do we make such a fuss about temporary works? Well, let me say, let me rephrase that. Why do people think we make a fuss of temporary works? Because to me, they are important, very, very important. But there is often a um, an idea that people are making too much of a, of a fuss about them. So going right back to the early days, well, not that early, but the early 1900s, collapse of um, an excavation at Newport Docks. Can't remember how many people killed there, but there was quite a few. Uh, Loddon Viaduct, which was the former force work collapse. Uh, I think gained three or four people died in that one. In fact, there's an interesting video that I think the TWF have just done on revisiting some of these, I think, either has been shared or about to be shared. I'm sure I saw something on LinkedIn last week about it, where they visited the site and talk about it. Uh, the Barton Viaduct, so that's the M60 that goes over the Manchester Ship Canal, um, which I think there was actually two collapses there. They had one collapse and then they had another collapse of a, a fairly similar operation. And then just adjacent, so there you can see the Barton Viaduct in the background. Just adjacent to that back in, I don't know, 2017, 18, there was the collapse of uh, the, the new lift bridge that went in there as well during construction. So there were an awful lot of incidents back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and that led to a lot of interest in construction and what, they, what we now call temporary works, I suppose. Um, and it culminated in 1975 with the publication of the Bragg Report. Now, if you're a designer and you haven't read the Bragg Report, you probably should, because it gives you a lot of indications about what we should be doing, because not all of the recommendations that Bragg made uh, made its way into 5975, unfortunately. There's still some that did not make their way in. A lot of them did, so we have the Bragg Report to thank for things like formalising um, the horizontal load rule or the notion of horizontal load we now use two and a half percent they recommended three percent the idea of lacing and bracing and making sure it's in um considering discontinuity and force work beams jack extensions making sure there's actually instructions for proprietary equipment the management of temporary work so the whole idea of a twc came from the brag report and has led to, to what we now have in BS5975, but it's well worth a read to refresh yourself. So since then, it's not perfect um, and things still go wrong. And there's just four examples of temporary works failures. Well, whether you can argue they were permanent works failures, but Gerard's Cross, it was in the temporary condition. So yeah, probably is a temporary failure. Um, Florida bridge collapse, which was quite a high profile one. And there's been a couple of presentations, two or three. I think the last one I saw was by um, Steve Williams from Network Rail. It's worth a watch. He's actually gone through it bit by bit. And also the OSHA report on the subject. Uh, OSHA being, the, I think, the HSE equivalent in America. Um, and they came out of the report very, very quickly. And it doesn't make for good reading for anybody who's involved in the construction of that bridge. Um, but again, well worth a read. 
for any engineer out there. The Nichols Highway Collapse, you can find presentations for about that online, which again are well worth a read. I don't think I've ever read anything about Gerard's Cross other than what was published at the time. And of course, there's the Power Station, um, which we're still waiting for the report on, uh, but arguably temporary works because it was a structure in a temporary condition that failed. So what do we have to do to manage temporary works? Well, you have to read and understand BS 5975, but that is perhaps quite a, uh, a weighty, meaty volume to work your way through. So previously we had the flow chart, which some of you may well have seen. We've now recently just launched the website. So this website is now live and anybody can sign in. So you have to sign up with us to get access. We're not going to spam you with anything. We're not going to sell your details or anything like that. It's purely so we've got some sort of control over who we share this information with. Very simple to register. Once you've registered, away you go. And then you'll be able to log in. And then you'll get these options here. So the principal contractor is going to cover most things about temporary works. I did just click on that. There we go. It's loading. So all we've done is we've taken the flow chart and we've turned it into um, a website. So it's got all of the flows that it had previously, which you can just follow through. But if you want to read more about it, it refers you back to the clause in 5975. And if you click on the little eye, it will give you a bit more information and again, refer you directly to the clauses that matter. So the flow is now set out. And again, if you want to look at it for, if you're not the PC, if you're um, a managing contractor or subcontractor, we have split it out differently for you because the role is different and what you're expected to do and how you're expected to work is different between those. And if you still want to get the, the PDF, um, then it's still available. Oops, sorry. Um, and so you can still click that and download the PDF if you want. So all here, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pick out a few points and carry on through and sort of discuss them in a little bit more detail. Some areas that perhaps are not fully understood or people aren't quite aware of. So the first one is uh, the designated individual. So every organization that works with temporary work, so whether that's a designer, a supplier of proprietary systems, um, a contractor installing it, a subcontractor, um, a specialist contractor, if they're working with temporary works and they're part of the management of temporary works, then they should have a designated individual. Now, this person is kind of the linchpin for temporary works within the organization. And they should be a senior person. So I think it says ideally board level or answering directly to the board. And they're the person who's responsible for managing temporary works. They make all the appointments. So if you need to appoint TWCs, it is the DI who appoints them and is responsible for vetting and making sure that they're happy. So it's quite a um, onerous responsibility, shall we say. Important that they that, that they are there. And also the point of call, if you are a TWC or a TWS and you're coming under undue pressure on site, the DI is probably a good person to, to speak to in those situations. If you've tried other avenues and you're not getting anywhere, the DI is there to back you up, assist you, and should be there to make sure the safety side isn't being pushed under the table or pushed under the carpet, should we say. They are, the TWC should not be the person who's under pressure to deliver a its program. It should be seen as a role that matters and what they're doing has to be done and it has to be done right. It's not just a piece of paperwork. So this idea of risk classes, so this is different to categories of check. Now, I, I've got to admit, I struggle with this slightly as a concept. I understand the point of the implementation class um, because what might be a very simple piece of temporary work in a greenfield site can become a very complex piece of work in a city centre site. Um, that all makes sense. And taking all of the things that are highlighted here into account makes perfect sense to me. But where I struggle is the clause where they state that 
the implementation class doesn't affect the category of check level um because to me that doesn't seem right it, it might be a nice idea but for instance if i design if i design um an earthworks retaining solution over here on a greenfield site and i want to put the same thing in here using the same approach the same system so sheet piles and a braced frame then the implementation risk class would suggest that this doesn't really change though you would arguably you'd be in a position where you have a catastrophic failure if this failed the railway could move and then you have a catastrophic incident so to me that would then drive the check to go from a cat 2 to a cat 3 check but the way it's written up here the check might be unchanged whereas i think those two are fairly fundamentally um linked but i'd welcome any further comments at the end of it because as i say i struggle with this this concept somewhat and um it'd be interesting if anyone else wants to have a chat about it ah, so my favorite um design brief so the design brief is the key piece of documentation um it should have in it everything that as a designer i will need to and to undertake my design so let me let me rephrase that it will have everything in it that i need to understand and to understand from you as my client that what you want from me and how you if you if you've got a solution in mind what your solution is if you haven't that's fine as long as you present the constraints we're fine we can crack on from there but surprisingly in this day and age we still get projects where the brief consists of a one-liner on an email which okay it might be all right for simple things but where it gets more complex the brief should really be a lot more in depth and it should make quite clear what your expect ex expectations are and more importantly your constraints so uh i was doing so i was looking for a way to explain this this morning this was the, the closest i came was a dilbert um comic which you can read what you're basically asking us to do is if you don't give us a good brief you're basically expecting us to guess what you want to do um that's not quite the same deal but what we're coming back to is garbage in garbage out which is a, a favorite saying of within and done it's if you give us rubbish information to start with don't be surprised if you get rubbish out the back end and, the, and this one's a little bit tongue-in-cheek but equally these are all actually based on real example so the number of cases in the past we've had someone say oh can you design a system using maybe or rmd or fabricated steelwork you then produce a design using the system they've, they've requested and they look surprised when you've produced the design using the system they requested similarly if you request a pilot platform design and you send us to spec for a soil mate sf65 that is what we'll use in the design. You tell us to use a geogrid, we'll use a geogrid. All of these things are examples of where people have sent us information and then of when they get the design back, are quite surprised as to what we produced. Um, it's garbage in, garbage out here. If you give us the right information at the beginning, you'll get your design at the end. And just last week, we had someone request a design for retaining all about two meters high uh there's no survey information but they told us that was the height and it turned out it was actually four and a half meters high which considerably changes the design output and what we've done the most important thing to remember is that as temporary works engineers we are definitely not mind readers much as i would like to have that ability we don't know unless you tell us now obviously if we come to site and we discuss things that's all well and good but if we just get an email with a one line or a two line and we ask for more information and it's not forthcoming, we'll do our best, but it comes back to garbage in, garbage out. So the next area to discuss is, is checking. So why is it that we check temporary works more than we check permanent works? Because quite regularly, permanent works will not get any more than a cat one check effectively. Someone will do the design and another engineer will look over their calculations and run through it with a red pen and say, yes, fine, or um, make changes as required. Whereas with temporary works, it's fairly common for CAT2 checks to be undertaken. And it's 
Yeah, fairly common. It happens. Cat three checks. So we do we do take more care with temporary works, and the reason is there is quite often the opportunity for a larger disaster with temporary works. We just saw some earlier on. Um, the Florida Bridge, the Nichols Highway, all of these things. There were lots of opportunities to kill people on a large scale, effectively. And then there's the other thing is when you have this temporary permanent works interface, it brings a lot of issues into play. Um, who is responsible for what? And then you also have fairly large loadings, or you can have fairly large loadings in the temporary condition. If you look at tower cranes, you get some huge moments. Uh, big piling rigs can be over 100 tonnes. Um, formwork and false work, if you're pouring things out over the public or uh, you're producing cantilevers, there's all sorts of things where, where things become trickier. Um, then, then you had in if the permanent works designer has taken no cognizance of what or how we're going to build the structure, um, that can make the construction process far more hazardous than it needs to be, and that requires more temporary works or more complex temporary works, which means you need a second opinion or a, a check to make sure you're happy. And then we also have this extended supply chain now as well. Uh, you might have client, PC, main contractor, subcontractor, and the subcontractor might well be the one appointing the designer. And in some cases, that designer is then just subbing the work straight out to another design practice, um, which may be in the UK, it might not be in the UK. It's There is a big, a big loop from right down at the bottom to the very top. And there's an awful lot of uh, interfaces that have got to be managed and properly managed to make sure that everything works together. So there are four check categories in 5975. Zero is basically the simplest temporary works going, uh, standard solutions. So that could typically be a um, manhole box, something like that, or a drag box, where you've got the proprietary instructions, you're using it in accordance with the limitations set down in the instructions. That's fine. Um, Cat one, simple designs. Cat one is I do the design, I pass it to Josh. Josh would look at it, review it, go through the calcs and say, yep, I agree with the approach you're taking there. Cat two. So cat two, um, the checker should not be making reference to the original design calculations. It states that quite clearly in 5975. Cat two check is not somebody reading through your calculations. So if you're not reading through the calculations, the only way you can determine if a design works or not is by producing your own calculations. So CAT2 and CAT3, there should be a separate set of calculations which justify the design. I don't see any way around that if you're doing it in accordance with BS5975. Though I know for sure there are people out there who are putting CAT2 on the check certificate when in reality they're doing a CAT1 check. So it's always worth asking that question with your supplier. Are they actually doing a CAT2 check or are they reviewing the original calculations? And the reason it's dangerous just to review someone's calculations is if you follow the logic of what the designer has done, you can be drawn into a false sense of security and follow through their calculations. Now, if you start afresh, if you take the design inputs and you take the drawing and you do your own set of calculations, you haven't been influenced by what the cat the original designer has done so you have to think about it yourself from scratch and that means you are likely or sorry it's it's unlikely you're going to use exactly the same approach as the designer and that's only a good thing because if you've justified it another way then that's brilliant it gives you a much more um um, what's the one before? It makes you feel better that the design is correct. If you know the CAT2 checker has done it independently and they have reviewed it and used their own approach, that's that's far better. Similarly for CAT3, it goes out to an external company and they do the CAT3 check. And it's important that they do not, that the CAT3 checker does not get the calculations from the designer. They can get the design statement, which sets out how they've done it. That's fine, but not the calculations themselves.
there we go so that's that so additional set of calculations for a cat two. so there's the clause from 5975 the checker should carry out the check without reference to the designer's calculations using only the design brief associated associated information and the design output you cannot look at the calculations now what should you expect when you get your cat two or more pointedly in this point in this case cat three back ideally they should use a different approach as i've said um now if you're using an external company for the cat three the chance of them using the same approach or the same software is even lower but if the design statement spells out how the, what the designer has used then the cat three checker can um try and use something different and a different approach i said you should never get back the original calculations with the red pen in them saying this isn't right this isn't right this isn't right from a cat three check because they shouldn't have even seen the calculations it definitely shouldn't be full of caveats so if you get a cat three check back and in the drn it reads like a also drn being a design um, response notice or design review notice if the drn has lots of caveats about what the checker hasn't and hasn't checked and uh is full of weasley words then you should take it back to the checker and say i want a cat three check again um it's it, they have to be satisfied or they have to spell out their concerns in a way that the designer can then address you can't just caveat out your responsibilities as a cat three checker what the cat three checker is saying or should be saying is they are satisfied that the design works it's as simple as that it shouldn't be a different design so sometimes a cat three checker will get carried away and will start suggesting a different design that's not a cat three check that's another design um any concerns or issues should be clearly identified and that means for a cat three check should be a specific document that highlights all the issues that you've identified that can then be passed to the appropriate people for response it's not a uh what's the word i'm looking for it's not it's not a case where you can go to war with a competitor. You should be able to sit down and resolve the issues. TWC should be involved with the review process. Um, and 5975 sets out quite clearly what is required. Uh, it's important to note though, many clients still insist on it, that calculations do not form part of the design output. Right. The other point that I think is still missed quite regularly uh, on site is this idea of an implementation plan. So the implementation plan should be taking information that is already freely available, well, not freely available, has already been produced and collates it into one place. That's all it is. So if you're putting up, uh, let's say, some propping in a building, you would have the design you'd have all your design and check certificates, you'd have all of the constraints clearly identified, you'd have your method statement and risk assessment in one place, and you would have everything that the TWS and TWC has got to do identified. Um, so it's just collating everything together. And if it's if it's temporary work which requires a bit more thought uh, and a, a test plan or similar, then that should all be there as well. It basically, what you're looking for is a method statement that specifically addresses the temporary works and what you've got to do to safely put those temporary works up. And just as importantly, how do you take them down again? And it should be a proper approved document with, with hold points within it. The other point that's often missed is uh, where we have these extended, uh, extended supply chains is there is inherent risk within that. So, as I said, if you've got the, the person who's done the design is seven or eight rungs down the supply chain, then somebody somewhere needs to be taking responsibility for making sure that what's been designed, and bear in mind there could be four or five or six subcontractors, all who are producing temporary works design, um, that are required on a project that all needs to be coordinated together and made sure that it works as an overall scheme and that is where a lead designer comes in and that role is quite an important one um 
thinking back to projects where we've seen it so where, where we did um the demolition of churchill way flyover we took the lead temporary works designer role and all the temporary works were coordinated by us and we made sure that everything holistically worked where another good example was birmingham new street where network rail had this process in place where you'd have your form 023 sorry form c submission for each temporary works design but they also produced or made you produce an umbrella form c now what this umbrella form c was it referenced all of the temporary works that would be ongoing at the same time now that then allowed somebody to coordinate and understand all of the temporary works that were happening in the next phase when they were going to happen and what the interfaces would be and how they would be managed uh, and as much as it was hard work producing all of the um umbrella form C's it did it did ensure that everyone could manage the project fully and that the, the TWC I think they I don't think they had a lead temporary works designer though if Steve Williams is on he'll correct me um was then coordinating everything and making sure that um the project could carry on safely uh, right that about brings me to the end so when I was putting this presentation together reading around the subject as you do and I came back across this document here, which I've, I've read in the past and read again this morning. Um, well worth a read for anybody involved in temporary works. Uh, what they've done is they've looked at the Bragg report and then seen how that will, or how that would be affected by the change to Euro norms. So if 5975 was dropped out, which it hasn't been, they were considering how that would leave the construction industry and also talking about how um, sort of before, how we're going to keep the, the collective memory of construction alive. So people who've lived through and seen these disasters and seen what happened before 5975 are retiring and how that is going to feed into the industry as a whole as we go forward. So well worth a read. As ever, if you want to read more, there is lots and lots of information out there if you go looking. I should have added the new website on there uh, for the Temporary Works flowchart. I will get Christian to email that out when he gets back, but you should be able to search for it. It is um, temporaryworksflowchart.com. Flowchart if you're not signed up to the cross newsletters, well worth it again as well. Um, not just temporary works, but talks about all of the ongoing issues that have been discovered across the UK. Uh, well worth, well worth a look. And if you are involved in temporary works, all of these documents here are well worth a look. And the temporary works forum has lots and lots of useful information. Uh, and if you are struggling to sleep, there is now, I don't know how many hours of webinars available online on our engineering consultant and on engineering consultant YouTube channel. Um, only at 337 subscribers, so only another couple of million to go, and then I can be a YouTube influencer. But we're a long way away from that yet. But we're getting there. Anyway, um, I think that's it for me. So we'll move on to the questions and answers.